Court rise. Appeal, part work in the matter of all, the Queen on the application of Plan B Earth Limited, and the Queen on the application of Friends of the Earth Limited, and the Queen on the application of the London Borough of Hillingdon and others, and the Queen on the application of Peter Hub Limited and another, and the Secretary of State for Transport and Rights. Yes. Yesterday, a point arose as to where does Greenpeace, the Borough's of the Mayor, stand on climate change. Yes. And uh, this morning I've been handed a document which may not be added off to your hand, which the Secretary of State's reply submission is climate change. But yesterday, when I said Mr. Luigi said he'd be handing up a list of references, he's handed up an eight page supplemental reply skeleton. I'll like, look at it for that. Right. Well, this, we haven't seen this. This is the first we've mm. known right, of it, likewise. I think. Could you turn to page 7, yes. paragraph 20? Yes. Just say why I'm on my feet first. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Mm. You see that there's one line in the virus skeleton below, intentionally or mistakenly, sought to support and be over and the earth. That would be helpful if you can do it briefly. It will be very brief. Thank All you. you need to have to hand is volume two, core volume two, and the judgment in from the division. If you turn to the joint core bundle two at tab seven, yes. and go all the way to page one, two, four, three. Well, we're working with um, the judgments separate from the bundles at the moment. You see paragraph 16. Yes. We just want to read that here. Thank you. And see what happens. And then back to core bundle 2, the message from core bundle 2. In right of that encouragement, you then find amended statement of facts and grounds in the same tab as the second. the AOS and the FPS itself fails to assess the impact 
sunk is under a subheading, the Settled Claimants of the Narrow Atlantic. This round of complaints is taken forward by Friends of the Earth in Plan B and is not addressed here. So there are no further submissions. All that we did is then two things. Same bundle, page 886. Yes. We can see already because there's a cross Yes, you were. Well, you could read those two <coughs> sub paragraphs again. That reflects the position of Greenpeace, the boroughs, and the mayor. And that was dated late 2018. And it was supplemented that on the 13th of March 2019, to assist the Divisional Court by a short note. I hand up the note, it isn't in your bundles, but perhaps in light of what's been said in paragraph 20, you should see it. Yes. yes. It's only it's very short and it's... Has Mr. Marici seen that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It also is the same Gosh. note. Oh well, yes, I see. So if you turn to the last page, you can see it's dated the 13th of March, 2019. I've put a line through the 14th G, etc. And if you read the first two paragraphs, and again in light of what's been said, perhaps you should see at some time the witness statement of John Solon, Executive Director of Greenpeace, and if it's necessary, we will add that. What I haven't done is update any of the references in this document. No. of Greenpeace as far as the mayor it is that they stand by paragraph 96 of their skeletal argument, not in the state. They favour the 5.3 argument rather than any other interpretation argument. So the 5? 5.3, sorry, 5.8. Yes. My numbers yes. 5.8 rather than section 10. Right. And we have not taken any other part in the debate since then. Section 6 letter that's asking for a review. And in that letter, the boroughs uh, and uh, I have to have the mayor's letter raises climate change as a reason for it. But that's not the yes. concern. No. Well, I, we had submissions on Section 6 yesterday. You don't seek to add to those at such a <coughs> stage. A slight concern in the way Mr. Marici put his submissions uh, on uh, climate change. Uh, we trust that he's not on behalf of the Secretary of State seeking to avoid uh, the question of review by saying it's all down to the DCO stage. And that's up to Mr. No, well, that's another question altogether. Thank you, Lord. No, thank you, Mr. Fleming. <coughs> and what I think might help us, if it's not too onerous for you and your team, is is to get these references, or at least the salient ones, updated. We will do that, we will add, add as an appendix to the witness statement of this December. Where might we put this so that we don't lose it? Um, and before we not. Uh, when, we, when we update it, we put numbers on please, it. Please, yes. And then uh, have reference. Yes, please, please do that. Instead of putting this is so well into witness statements, it's perhaps we just an exit for this one. Yes, you can find a suitable place for it. And the uh, many bundles we have. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, Mr. Ricci. My Lord, um, I provide you with a note to try and assist because I've got very limited time to deal with the only four hours of submissions that there were yesterday on climate change from Plan B and um, Friends of the Earth. I've obviously got less time now than I had previously. What I was 
Well, well we, shall ensure, we shall ensure that you have the time that Great. was well, originally agreed. Well, what I've done in this note is, where I've highlighted in yellow, that's where I'm going to take you to a reference. Otherwise, I'm pretending to, to let it stand as references. Right, so you don't, you don't want to introduce the document separately <coughs> and go to it in your submissions. Um, well, what I was going to do is I was going to, I was going to use the notes based on my submissions. Yes, that's probably a sensible thing to do. So what, what I've done is, you'll know that I was on my first of my four headings, which was the overarching points. Yes. I hadn't quite finished those. No. So I start with continuing the overarching points. So my yes. Well, before you, said, before you do that, uh, the court, uh, for its part, has a question or two for you. from the submissions you were making to us yesterday afternoon. Uh, the court is particularly keen to understand the government's position on this question. At the initial stage, the very first stage of the whole ANPS process, uh, what consideration, if any, was given to the Paris Agreement. I might describe that, um, for want of a better metaphor, as the blank sheet of paper stage. That is to say, before the strategy was actually conceived at all. Uh, following that question um, would be the connected question. What evidence is there of that <coughs> consideration before the court? And how did that um, consideration of the Paris Agreement, if it was considered, um, find its expression, if at all, in the ANPS itself? Those are three questions. Yes. They're connected. Well, one of the, the, the evidence on this, in terms of the whole ANPS process and our consideration of Paris, is the paragraph that I took you to yesterday from Caroline Lowe's written statement, number one. Yeah. And number two, there is also there is also evidence which I'm coming to in a, in a little bit later in Ursula Stevens' written statement on <coughs> SEA. So about the consideration of the in the SEA process. Those are the two sources of evidence that there are before this court on the consideration of the game to Paris throughout the ANPS process. I mean, also obviously beyond that, um, you've seen reference to, and again I will touch on this in a moment, there were references to the Paris Agreement being raised by consultees, and the government gave various responses to that, even in response to the consultation. Well, it would help us, I think, to have a collection of these references. Well, well we can do that for you if that was it, so I'm simply put it together on a single sheet of paper. But, but the references we want must go to the questions I have raised with you. Well, well I don't have any set of evidence to point to. I've had the Lordship says the initial stage. I, the evidence covers, as you've seen it, it covers the consideration of the ANPS as a whole, as a composite whole process. It doesn't delve into the specific chronology of, the, of which point consideration took place. But I'll collect together those references for you um, in, in due course. But what um, is the substantive answer to the first question? Well, what well, consideration just, was given by the government, if any, to the Paris Agreement at the blank sheet of paper stage of this whole exercise? Well, well the, all I can say to that is the answer is the same answer that comes from Caroline Rowe's witness letter, which is that consideration was given to Paris Agreement, but decided it was decided that it was not the basis of which there should be an assessment of the ANPS. But I can't help you on that chronology beyond what's in the witness statements. Effectively, I've shown you that, and I'm going to show you that's the statements in, a, in a moment. Let me pause for a second to see whether my lords wish to follow my own questions or do with any of their own. Yes, may I approach it in a slightly different way? Not so much on the facts, but on, on what the legal submissions are. Uh, can I start in this way? At the material date, which is the date when the Secretary of State publishes the ANPS in June 2018, 
if a reasonable member of the public had asked the Secretary of State this question, is it or is it not your government's policy to comply with the Paris Agreement? What would the answer have been? Well, the answer would have been that they, and again, I just come back to what I said yesterday, yes, the government was committed to the objectives of the Paris Agreement, but those, those commitments cannot be applied at the national level without decisions about how and when you give effect to that agreement. Uh, and until those decisions were made, the view was taken it wasn't appropriate, it wasn't relevant to look at the Paris Agreement in assessing the aim because it's simply not possible to judge the ANPS against a global target until that global target is transposed into national policy. Well, I understand. Absolutely. Well, there is, I, I, there is um, in my position, there is... Well, I'll, actually, I'll come to that later. All right. Well, given that answer, yes. can I be clear what your legal submission is? is? Is it your legal submission that the phrase government policy in section 5, subsection 8, is to be interpreted as not including the Paris Agreement, and, and, and or not, not including yes. the government's commitment to the Paris Agreement. Well, well yes, it, it, in one very particular respect, that is dealt with by the Divisional Court. Can I just show you that now, what the Divisional Court said? Because there's, there's three paragraphs of the Divisional Court's judgment, which in my submission answer this. So can I ask you first of all to go to 607 in the Divisional Court's judgment? <coughs> Sorry, well, 608. Yes, Yes. So Parliament has determined the contributions of the UK towards climate <coughs> change. Of course, that's not framed in terms of inflated temperature reduction. A national contribution could not be so framed, but it's clearly based on the global temperature limit of 2052 degrees. No one's just otherwise. However, the target section 1 of the net UK carbon cap contributed at least 80% that was set by Parliament, having taken into account not just environmental but economic, social, and social factors. It's an entrenched policy in the sense that the target cannot be changed other than in accordance with the Act, i.e., only if there have been significant developments in scientific um, knowledge or new law or policy and after taking the advice of the CCC and the subject of the parliamentary affirmative conclusion procedure. Um, so I'll come to the other ones in a moment, but what the court's saying, and I'd say absolutely correctly, is that the key thing about assessing the ANPS is about the target that you should assess it against. And the targets are an entrenched policy, excluding Paris, because until Paris is incorporated through that statutory mechanism, it is not part of this entrenched policy setting our targets. I don't understand this at all. Uh, I, I, you, 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 I think, confirmed that if a member of the public, a reasonable member of the yes. public, asked, what is the government's policy? Are you committed to Paris or not? Yes. The answer is, I think, yes. Then what, what, what does, what does, what's this all got to do with what the government's policy is? This is all about legislation. No, well, the, 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 the key element of the policy in this regard is the actual targets that you assess the AMPS against. That is the key, that is really all we are talking about, because um, beyond that, how, how can one in any meaningful way talk about the <coughs> of the NPS against the carbon, uh, against carbon? The, the only thing that we bite is the target. Uh, but, but you may be right, Mr. Marici, <coughs> and I don't want to take you out of turn at all. <coughs> it may be that these are the sorts of things that the ANPS would and should have said, because remember, Section 5.8, doesn't require the government to do anything other than explain something. It's a reasons obligation. It's a very important reasons obligation. It doesn't require a particular outcome. But what it does arguably require is that the government explains to Parliament and to the public, this has been our thinking process. Now, you may be right. The thinking process may have been, we've considered Paris, but actually it's not uh, something that we think uh, we should do at this stage for the following reasons. And, and those might be regarded by the public as bad reasons, good reasons, utterly compelling reasons, but at least everyone would know what the government's explanation is. Well, well um, I'll have to come to, to this, 
uh, it is in my notes, but the Division Report made a series of findings about what 5, 7 and 5, 8 would quash, which is for us to explain our policy, not to respond to points of rage, but to explain our policy. And what the ANPS does, and this is what I was trying to mm. suggest yesterday, is that when you read the ANPS, there is no question that it was saying that the assessment would be against the targets in the Climate Change Act. The Climate Change Act is referred to repeatedly as the basis upon which the ANPS is assessed. Mm. And my Lord, <coughs> nobody who read, read that would be left in any doubt about what the basis of the assessment was. The basis of the assessment was the Climate Change Act. Now, I know Mr. Crossland complains people didn't know using speech patterns. Well, I say not so, and I'm going to show you some more references in my notes to that. But my Lord, Take Plan B, who didn't actually respond at all during several consultations, had no involvement at all that we know of. Um, but when they commenced their litigation, the first thing they said was, you didn't assess against Paris, you assessed against the Climate Change Act. It's unlawful, and please review it. I don't want to interrupt you at all, Mr. Rich. You know, forgive me, if you want to finish that submission, of course you must be able to. But I hope I've made it clear <clears throat> what my question is, never mind what submissions anyone else is making, my question is not about assessment against Paris criteria. It's not about any particular outcome. It's simply about explaining the thinking process. Because the thinking process may be exactly as you have now submitted. It was. The difficulty is we don't see that in the ANPS. Well, in my submission, what we were required to do was to explain our policy, and our policy was that we were assessing this against the ANPS. Forgive against. me, it doesn't say that. 5.8 says, explain how government policy has been taken into account. And if government policy includes, it may not do as a matter of law, but if it includes the government's commitment to Paris, where in the ANP does the government explain how that's been taken into account? Well, Ronald, I, mean, Ronald, I, I mean, I do say, Ronald, that the fact that we've ratified the treaty and the fact that the government says they are committed to implementing a treaty does not make that, in my submission, government policy. No, that I understand. So, so the legal submission is the phrase government policy in 5A does not include an unincorporated international agreement. Is that right? Well, yes, because oh, that I understand. Well, that, that's, a, that's a pure yeah. question of law. Uh, and well, otherwise, of course, say, for example, the, the Planning Act 2004 requires all local plans and development plans to have regard to national policy. Now, if national policy included uh, every unincorporated convention that might be relevant, that would have a huge distorted effect in the way that that works. And I say that phrase just doesn't capture. Yes, I now, well, I do accept, of course, that there were obviously <coughs> statements made by the government about the fact that they were committed mm. to implementing Paris. But, of course, they hadn't done that at the relevant time. It was not implemented. And Paris is a particularly, um, it raises a particularly acute issue around this because some international obligations, you can see, in a, even in a, in, a, in a modest system, could have a direct application straight through to the national law of, of the modest state that had that, that rule. But Paris Agreement can't, because by definition, it requires you to nationally determine things before it can have any real fault. And, and that's why Paris is, in a way, particularly acute to a form of this. Until that is implemented, it's, it's given effect to a nationally determined aspect is decided on. It's not, in, in, in this sense, part of the policy. Yes, I see. Well, that's a solution. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, can I, um, there was one other point you asked me yesterday, which I should just give you an answer to, which, my lords, was that you asked about whether the um, Paris Agreement replaced the Kyoto Protocol. Yes, uh, the word I used was superseded, superseded. I think. Well, the short answer is it doesn't. Um, well, they're both <coughs> made under the UN Framework Convention climate change. Um, they are ratified by slightly different parties, but my Lord, what we've, um, what we've been able to discover is that they are both still in effect. You'll know that originally Kyoto ran to 2012, but as the judgment points out, 561, 562, it was extended to 2020 by a Doha agreement. So at the moment they are both uh, effectively right. <coughs> um, Obviously one of them will expire in time, um, not too long away. But the Paris Agreement doesn't 
replace and succeed the Kyoto uh, Protocol. Yes, thank you. I'll just pause for a second. Sense of the um, sense of the notes. Um, well, it's, it's the last of my overarching points. And well, I've set out some post-designation events that you've got references to in the agreed um, chronology and, and narrative of events. But following the AAPS, the there's some four, four events that are referred to throughout the claimant's claims. One is the IPCC's report um, on um, global warming. In October, and then following that, the government commissioned the climate change commission to advise on whether to uh, revise the targets in the Act based on Paris. And you'll remember that's my MB on the 15th of October. That was what the climate change committee said in their October 16th advice should be a trigger for them being asked to advise again. And then that report, that advice, came out on the 2nd of May. The day after the Divisional Court's judgment. Um, and can I just ask you to note one thing? I'll, I'll show you this a bit later on in, in, in another document if I can. Um, one of the things the Climate Change Committee did say was that they would be making a separate recommendation on the approach for aviation. And they eventually did that on the 24th of September 2019. I haven't put that in the chronology, but you'll see it referred to later on. And then um, the government responded on the 12th of June to say they would amend the target, and then the target was amended at the end of <coughs> June. Now, why does any of this matter? And well, the reason it matters is, can I ask you to go to core bundle 3, page 1398. Paragraph 4. This, my lord, is the amended statement of facts and grounds of Friends of the Earth. This is Friends of the Earth pleaded case in the judicial review. And you'll see that paragraph 3, they summarise at A, B, and C, their three grounds of judicial review. And then four, they say that at the heart of those, i.e. those grounds, all those grounds, is the way in which the NPS has dealt with a picture in terms of climate change obligations and climate change policy, which is likely to change between now and the point at which the Secretary of State comes to consider an application for development consent under the plan. So that is what lies at the heart of all of, F of FOE ground, all of them. They are concerned that the climate change policy could and may well change between the AMPS being made and the DCA being determined. Now what we say, to go back to the note, is we say this underlines why Friends of the Earth's case is unarguable. So first of all, it's not been argued by Plan B or Friends of the Earth that we were obliged to await these developments before we designated them. I just ask you to note in the footnote, boroughs did run an argument like that in their original plea case, but they did not pursue it. Secondly, none of these events can directly affect, in the sense of impugning, the lawfulness of the designation, because obviously it predated these events. But, it's the third point, it's always been our case that there were a number of ways in which future climate change policy developments, i.e. the events in the table above which were in the future of the nation, will be at the summer anticipated, and any further future developments in climate change policy, or indeed changes in climate change science, for example on non-CO2, could be considered, i.e. there were ways in which what lies at the heart of Friends of the Earth's concerns, or all its grounds, could be dealt with. And there's three answers to it over the page, Roman 1, 2, 3. One is the AMPS 5.82, which I took you to yesterday, and those references. And you know, in summary, the concern of the claimants is that Heathrow's action should be assessed against Paris. And it will be via Section 582 of the DCA, following, and we say through the front door, following the amendments of the targets in the Act. And as you know, it's always been our case that 5.82 was meant to be interpreted in that way, i.e. it called whatever the obligations were at the moment of the DCA. Yes. Would it be fair to say that this is, as it were, the incorporation of the Paris Agreement targets 
into the strategy once the strategy has been set? Well, it's a way in which, I mean, obviously the concern of Friends of the Earth is things may change between AMS designation and the PCA. And they're right, of course, and things have changed. For example, the climate change targets in the Act have been amended. So the, the AMPS was designed, as I, I, and I, I, I hope this is what your logic was suggesting. Well, my, my question, to make it clear, goes back to my earlier question of you this morning. The paragraph 582 um, consideration, which you say effectively builds in the Paris Agreement targets once incorporated yes. into national legislation, operates within the strategy once set. I mean, clearly it's part of the yes. ANPS yes. strategy. Yes. Um, I'm not seeking to go over the ground we've just covered with you. No. But is that a fair way of characterising yes. it? Yes. Um, so it was, always, it was always intended to ensure that if, if the targets change, which I would have referred to in 582, yeah. you would test the scheme against those new targets, not... The old, the old time. Yes, well, that was a submission you yes. made firmly well, yesterday. Well, there's two other answers to this. <coughs> First of all, section 104. Can we go back to that? Which is in volume one of the authorities, volume one of the authorities, tab one. And we looked at 104 four yesterday. I want to look at a couple of other provisions in 104. <coughs> You'll remember this is the key decision making section uh, in relation to. Decisions where there's relevant national policies. Yes. And my Lord, see, first of all, can I draw attention to 104.2d? In deciding the application, the Secretary must have regard to any other matters which the Secretary of State thinks are both important and relevant to the Secretary of State's decision. So, again, if things change, that is another route in which one can consider changes. But my Lord, also, I'll draw your attention to sub 5 and 6. They uh, absolve the Secretary of State from having to determine the DCO in accordance with the NPS if it would lead to a breach of any duty imposed on the Secretary of State or would be unlawful under any enactment. So again, I don't really need that point because my Lord 582 really covers this anyway within the ANPS. But if it didn't, that would be another route to argue if your scheme is going to compromise the target, <coughs> it shouldn't be granted in, in accordance with the NPS. Now, you don't get to those here because the AFPS in 5.82 builds in that uh, uh, assessment against the revised targets. And then, my lords, the third way in the note, bring them through, is section 6. And my lords, section 6 is the review position. Uh, and my lords, you should also, uh, if you look, I don't think you look at section 6 in particular, but if you look at section 13 just briefly, we're back in the document. <coughs> Just point out to your lordships that um, section 13, 2 and 3 provide that if the Secretary of State declines to carry out a review, or if he decides to carry out a review, that triggers a separate statutory judicial review of the challenge under section 13. So you can challenge again if the Secretary of State doesn't review. But my lords will remember that section 6 itself. Um, Sorry, the, the subsection in section 13? 13, 2 and 3. 2 and 3. Two and three. And the time scale for that, six, six weeks, weeks beginning with the day of the decision not to carry out the review. Yes. And the default in making such a decision? Well, there is no default. But could there be a claim for judicial review in the event of a failure to determine before moving on to the next well, stage? Well, in theory, yes. In theory, yes. All the mandate, and all the mandatory order. Mandatory order. Or declaration. Well, I'll come to the... I've got time, I'll come to the chronology of this in, 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 in a bit, but um, my lords, um, can I just start you to draw your attention to one paragraph in the judgment, you'll see this is Roman 3C, can we just go to 107 in the judgment? I've drawn your attention to several paragraphs, we in section 6, um, and the analysis of the original court is based on the observations of the Lord of the Sales, uh, in, I think I said, uh, Blue Green Economy, so 107 of the judgment. <coughs> Are we putting the act away now? Um, well, can you just give me one Would it be safer to keep I it down? I think it might be safer to keep it down, my lord. I think we'll be coming back to it in, in a little bit, depending on my, on my time. Um, 
My Lord, you'll sit at 107. Um, four or five lines down, he says, National infrastructure projects often give rise to a host of issues, and it's quite possible that relevant considerations will change or evolve after an NPS has been designated. But exactly the concern that underlies all friends of the NPS, particularly where long leading times are involved. For example, the science on climate change or risk to public health and pollution may change along with solutions to addressing such matters. Parliament was fully aware of this possibility and provided for it in Section 6. So well, that's the third answer to the concern that underlies all the premise of the Earth's case, that if necessary and appropriate, you could review the APS. But we say, in relation to Paris, that's not necessary, because you've got 582. But if it is necessary, in relation to Paris, or other events, well, then people have requested us to consider it, and we will consider it. And the scope of a review would embrace, would it, um, abandonment of the strategy altogether. It can, well, yes, because Section 6, as Mr. Wolf pointed out to you yesterday, if you look at Section 6, 3 and 6, 4, you can either review the whole or the part. And, well, there's also a power to suspend it while you're reviewing it, etc. So, well, there's various provisions that are built in to deal with exactly the situation of, if there really are very significant changes that require you, and they're unanticipated, and they would have made policy difficult because those are the tests, if all those tests are there, there's another route uh, to changing the policy, to dealing with the situation of change. And, and my Lord, all I want to draw your attention to in terms of the facts, <coughs> the, um, Plan B, in fact, in the letter before claiming these proceedings, requested us to undertake a Section 6 review on the basis we hadn't considered Paris. Uh, and we declined to do that, and there was no further judicial review by Mr. Crossland. Mr. Crossland has since come back with another request, as have others, which I've recorded to bullets. Can I just briefly show you what our response is? Um, I'm going to be very brief on this, because I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. But Friends of the Earth Bundle model, tab 15, page 235. something that's been consulted on 
um, and um, it's coming at that time later in 2019. And then the final bullet there, once that strategy is adopted, it would itself be an important and relevant matter under Section 142 of the Planning Act. It will be a further policy, uh, and that's a further policy that the government has always intended would be in place um, by the time the PCO comes to be um, applied for. So well, I was in short, that's three, the heart of the grounds, of all the grounds of the present year, is things might change between the AMKS and the PCO, and our case is multiple mechanisms built in to both the AMKS itself and the statutory scheme that deal uh, with that. Uh, and for that reason, well, we say that the judge, judges below got it exactly right in what they said at 648, and I'll that very briefly. statutory scheme in the Act and the work that has been done on if and how to amend the domestic laws of the Act Agreement, the Secretary of State did not argue the Act unlawfully in not taking into account that agreement when referring the scheme and in designating the NGS as he did. As we have described, if, and this is going beyond policy, if scientific circumstances change, and while that must be a reference to the non ca 2 point it's open for him to review the NGS in any event at the DCA status issue will be released on the basis of their up to date in that regard it's a scientific position but also important to treat the policy as well. So my lords, can I then turn um, in the notes, you'll see the Friends of the Earth's case is the next heading. And my lords, ground A, eight subgrounds, and I'm going to focus on A7 and A8. As I said yesterday, A1 to A6 were not pursued already. And my lords, as I explained in paragraph one, they proceed on a fundamental misunderstanding. Because what Friends of the Earth suggested was that the Divisional Court gave the same meaning to Section 10.3 as they did to 5.8, despite the language of those sections being different. Now, well, that's not what the Divisional Court did, because what the Divisional Court held was that 5.8 excluded the Paris Agreement because it wasn't government, pol government policy, and that was, of course, agreed with by Friends of the Earth. But Model 10.3 did not exclude it as a consideration. 10.3 was effectively a provision that allowed it to be considered, but didn't require it to be considered. So well, they did not reach the same view as to what these two statutes meant. One, under one it was excluded, and under one it could be considered, but didn't have to be considered. And well, on that basis, all the complaints that are made under A1 to 6 fall away, because they're actually firing a target <coughs> They're firing at a conclusion that wasn't reached by the Division of Court. Yeah. So, can I focus then on ground A7, which is over the page on page 4? Yes. And well, this is where Friends of the Earth's alleged that the Supreme Court was wrong to hold that the Secretary of State could, but did not have to have regard to uh, the Paris uh, Agreement. Now, well, the judgment kicks off with viewings, as well known to all the courts, three categories of consideration under an Act. Those you have to take into account, those you have to exclude, and those you can take into account. Yeah. That's the discretion. And, and well, ordinarily, we say, unincorporated international obligations are going into that third category. There are things that you don't have to take into account, unless there's some contrary indication that you get out. But you can take into account. And that's, we say, Hurst, which we've given you the references but also YAP, which I'll come into in a moment. Now we say in a normal way the Paris Agreement forces about third category, so there's something the Secretary could choose to have regard to that wasn't required to have regard to. Now Mr. Wolf submitted yesterday the Paris Agreement was something the Secretary had to consider under 10.3a, but 10.3a doesn't say that. And elsewhere in the Planning Act, of course, section 144, unincorporated obligations are specifically referenced as being things that have to be taken. And he also suggested, I think possibly in the alternative, although I wasn't clear, that the Paris Agreement was so obviously material that the Secretary of State was required to have regard to it. But of course, on that analysis, the Secretary of State wasn't required to take it into account by the Act, but he had a discretion whether to consider it. And for some reason, it was irrational of the circumstances of this case for him not to do so. Have you considered um, the classic statements of principle in Creed NZ? Well, yes, and they're covered in, um, so for example, Hearst, which I've quoted yes. there, 
when you go back to Hearst, that site, Creek Lane Centre, that's the kicking off point. Is yeah. that Lord Justice Carnworth as you then watched? Um, Lord, Justice, Lord Justice Simon Brown? Yes, Lord Justice Simon Brown. Yes, yes. As you then watched? Yes, yes. Um, and then well, we also come to, to Yam, which I mean, probably the easiest thing to go to our skeleton, which is probably the relevant part. So well, that's in. Uh, CB13, page 296. CB13, CB, CB um, page 296. Well, I have drawn your attention to 49 and 50 of my person, but given the time, I think you can probably just deal with 49. You'll see that at the bottom of the paragraph, I think it's dealt with. Brind and Hurst, we refer to Yam, Lord Mance, a domestic decision maker exercising a general discretion. One is neither bound to have regard to this country purely as a qualification, nor bound to give effect to them, but two, may have regard to the United Kingdom as national qualifications if he or she desires that this is to be, is to be appropriate. Which, of course, I mean, coincidentally is the language that we use, it is coincidentally. But you accept that this is all subject to pure rationality? Yes, my lord, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, once you go into the third category, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's something you can choose to take into account. Yeah. And obviously, mm -hmm. there is a control over it in terms well, of. I think, I think fundamentally, that's the argument for, from Friends of the Earth uh, that if you posit again the reasonable member of the public, in 2018, given that Everyone knows what uh, is, is on people's minds. Uh, Paris is, on any view, so it's said, <coughs> a hugely significant development in this arena. The project being considered is a huge infrastructure project with a lifespan of about 80 years. I think it's simply said, how could any reasonable person not conclude that this is something we have to take into account at this stage. Well, well don't forget that the Climate Change Committee's extant advice, and they were the statutory body uh, charged by Parliament for taking advice, and their advice was that our current existing targets at that time were potentially consistent. And that was a key reason why we were not, at that stage, to do anything to amend the Act to deal with the Paris. So well, that, that is why it was well, rational to, to, to do so. It wasn't, it, it's, a, it's an agreement that only bites <coughs> when you make your nationally determined contribution decisions. And the Climate Change Committee were advising specifically that it was poten that potentially, potentially it was consistent, uh, our own targets were consistent. Well, in those circumstances, it cannot possibly be irrational to have proceeded on the basis of the settlement under the Climate Change Act the centrepiece of our statutory provisions dealing with climate change, and which has a mechanism not exercised at that time because of the climate change in times, to amend that act to deal with the Paris Climate Accords. Plus, of course, the NPS has its own built in method of dealing with it. So, well, when you put all that together, and this is really the switch I made yesterday, I said, when you look at all that together, it must, cannot be said to be irrational to have taken the view that we did, that Paris was not the appropriate. Rather, it was the target in our own act until such times they were amended. And when they were, if they were, <coughs> was, was if they were then, but no, no, they have been amended, there are mechanisms, numerous mechanisms, for that to be dealt with. Well, those are, as I say, not, not irrational. And then we'll ground a eight. Just pausing before you turn to that, and but briefly, I owe Lord Brown an apology. Uh -huh. uh, was already Lord Brown, Lord Brown, no longer Lord Justice Simon Brown, <coughs> when he said what he did in Hurst. Yeah. And you'll see that that does, that's got Creed and Zedis at the heart of those paragraphs. It does. Um, well, then, Ground A8, just briefly, well, proceeds on the basis that grounds of the Friends of the Earth accepted it wasn't something that we were required to take into account, we had a discretion. <laughs> Uh, and they say we didn't exercise that discretion. 
Now, on the call dealt with that at 648, we say entirely correctly. I don't think it's good to give it to 648. So but, my lords, the additional points that we make are I showed you the evidence yesterday, I'm not going to go back to it, of Caroline Love. She says we considered but rejected the setting of the Paris because we were following the CCC's advice. It's not that we never considered whether to accept the setting of Paris, but we decided it wasn't appropriate and it wasn't the relevant thing. And my lords, I do not accept the suggestion of the setting of the but this is something that you didn't consider. The evidence does not support his fair submission that we simply said we couldn't log the effect into account. That's not what the evidence says. And the rest of Mr. Wall's case, point two, really just involves what we say is misreading or misconstruing our original pleadings. But my really no benefit can come from me plowing back through the history of our pleadings, especially given the time that I've got. We don't accept what we said about our pleadings, and I've given you a reference to what we say in our scope. Can I then turn to ground B and, and reasons? So the complaint here is the Divisional Court failed to give any reasons on non-CO2 and the effect of emissions beyond 2050 because the project, of course, will last longer than that. And what Friends of the Earth say, my lords, is that the Divisional Court instead focused on the Paris Agreement on which it gave full reasons, albeit ones they disagree with. But they say these are separate and freestanding points. Well, my lords, um, I won't take up these references now, but what I'll explain to you about them, if you look at Friends of the Earth's case, this is their skeleton, paragraph 45A and B in this court. Looking at beyond 2050, it's quite clear that FOE have always tied this point about looking at beyond 2050 to Paris. So the very next very time they made that point about Paris, they immediately sorry about 2050 and beyond. They immediately cite Paris. And well it's the same in paragraph 6C of Friends of the Earth skeleton. That point about looking beyond 2050 has always been tied by them, always been tied by them to uh, Paris. Well, so I'm, I'm, I don't follow this. Well, why, well, why is that a bad point? Sorry, my lord. Why, why is it no, bad? Well, not bad but, but, but the issue is my learned friend accepts the court gave full reasoning on Paris and oh, doesn't agree with it. Yes. So it says the court didn't separately deal with this point. Oh, but, well, the reason they didn't separately deal with it was because even on his own case, you know, he merged these two. That's why they didn't give separate reasons. It's merged. Well, that's the only reason I make that point. Right. And well, you'll then see in 12, the <coughs> Divisional Court did, contrary to what Friends of the Earth say, deal with these points. The reasons were certainly adequate given this was a refusal of permission. But in any event, if you disagree, this is what I'm going to focus on. The points, underlying points, are bad ones, so I'm going to come to that. So, well, in terms of the Divisional Court dealing with this, um, we dealt with this in our skeleton of paragraph 76. Um, and what we've said is, the judgment starts, sets the arguments against section 10, then in 637, accurately sets out the case that was being made on post-2050, and ties it to Paris, because that's what the court did throughout. Then over the page, judgment 638 sets out the secretary's case, and uses the words, or otherwise, so it says Paris agreement, and then it says, or otherwise, post-2050, non-CO2. So recognising that there were separate points of difference, um, although they had links to Paris Agreement. And then model 648, which I showed you earlier, where the court concluded that the changes in scientific circumstances could be dealt with, that specifically has to be a reference to the non-CO2 points that Mr. Wolf was pursuing. And I'll, I'll show you why in a moment. So, models, then I say the level of reasoning by the court on these issues was clearly sufficient. But in any event, these points are bad ones. So can I ask you on non-CO2, just to take up our skeleton again, <coughs> that bundle one, tab three, page 1303. <coughs> which which one? bundle one, tab three. Yeah. And page? 303, my lord. 303. <coughs> so, not 1303. Not, not 1303. <coughs> Paragraph 78 starts at the bottom of 303, yeah. relies on the following matters. If you go over the page, it's all about non CO2. So, well, first of all, the assessment of non CO2 emissions is currently too uncertain to be capable of accurate measurement. And that is clearly stated in the ATF, which remains the government's policy. 
So it says non-CO2 emissions from aviation can have both cooling and warming effects on the climate and <coughs> likely overall warming impact. Despite advances over the past decade, considerable scientific uncertainty remains about the scale of the effect of climate change of non-CO2 emissions. As a consequence, there's no consensus on whether or how to mitigate them. So that's the current government policy, which is not under challenge in these proceedings. So Mr. Graham from the Air Force Commission explains in his witness statement that the exclusion of non-CO2 impacts aligns with the advice of the Climate Change Committee given in 2012. But moreover, they raised this issue, the chair of the Air Force Commission raised this directly with the chair of the CCC, who advised the appropriate approach was not to assess or achieve CO2. So they specifically went to the statutory body and they were told, don't do it because of the scientific uncertainty. That's Mr. Graham's evidence. Uh, well, the position remains that there is scientific uncertainty, and that's recorded in the Climate Change Annex that was agreed between ourselves and the Defence of the Earth. And then, four, um, the AMPS and the AOS considered non CO2 emissions, but took the same view as the government policy, the view of the CCC as well, that it was impossible at this stage for the scientific uncertainty to assess them. So that's the conclusion I've set out there in the AOS, what was said about non CO2, that effectively it couldn't be assessed at this stage. And then five, the government made the same points in response to the consultation, and indeed in the face of the state. Yes. And then was six, the Climate Change Act 2008 can be, but has not been amended to allow for setting targets for non CO2 emissions. So again, that's something that you can amend following climate change from two plants, that has not happened at this stage. So well, there's, when you come down to it, the ground of review is that we failed to take into account non-CO2 impacts. But what we've explained very clearly throughout the documents, and in accordance with government policy, is it wasn't possible to do so on the basis of current scientific knowledge. And therefore, following the advice of the CCC, also the view of the Air Force Commission, we did not consider that in the assessment. So there was no public or floor Never mind what level of reasoning the division court did or did not give in relation to that issue. Now, if science moves on, yes. or the understanding of this moves on, um, do you make parallel submissions to those you've already made about uh, paragraph 582, etc.? Well, not about 582, my lord, because 582 is about carbon. Yes, if that relates only to carbon. It does, but it, I do make the same points in relation to section 104 yes, I two, uh, and I'll also, of course, there's a review, and that's, of course, one of, if you go to 648 in the judgment, that's exactly what the, what the court below is saying. They're saying um, yeah. if there are scientific circumstances change, it's only to review, <coughs> or in any event, the DCO stage, the issue will be registered on the basis of the up-to-date scientific position, because that would be I assume what's being said, that would be an important and relevant consideration within section 142 d Yes. And then, my lords, um, I then turn in the note 15, sub 2, to this point about 2050 and the life of the project. Now, my lords, there's one point made in the scope I don't need to take you to about that, but my lords, just these references, I, I haven't got time to take them up, but I'll explain what they are. Caroline Lowe's 463 says it's the role of the emerging, um, uh, uh, emerging um, AAS, the Airport Strategy, to deal with post-2050. That, that emerging policy, which we saw in the to, is going to deal with post-2050. She also deals specifically with points about 2050, because she's in two places, third place in her evidence, which I'll give you references. Two, about how that was being considered. Thirdly, as Mr. Wolf showed you yesterday, the carbon appendix of the AOS did model carbon emissions beyond 2050. It can't be said to something we wholly ignored. We modelled beyond 2050. <coughs> and there was, in addition, that same carbon appendix says later on <coughs> that the scheme will need to provide mitigation to continually minimise future emissions throughout its life i.e. there's a need to look at the PCO stage of mitigation that continually minimises future emissions. And of course there are um, general statements about the need for mitigation also in the AMPS. So well, again, the public law complaint must be that we didn't consider the position of the uh, well, in my submission, it was considered, and our evidence supports that. There's reference to it in the carbon appendix. 
And really, my learned friend's complaint can only be that he's not happy with the level of consideration that we gave. Uh, not that we didn't consider, not that we cannot say, in my submission, but it's something that we left out of the account. So, well, again, whatever the level of reasoning of the court below, which we say was adequate on this point, because Mr. Wolfe very explicitly linked this case to the to Paris and Bennett. So, my lord, whether the court gave good, good enough reasons or not, there's no merit in the underlying public. Now, my lords, can I then turn to ground... Before you do, can, can I just ask you what your submission is on the interpretation of Section 10? My lords, Section 10? Do you, yes, do you accept or do you not accept that the phrase sustainable development is potentially broader than climate change? Broader than climate change? Well, yes. Well, it is, yes. Well, it, is, it must be, because I mean, obviously the, the climate change is a... The way the Act structured, what was intended was you have to consider sustainable development, that's sub two. And sub no, it, three. Doesn't, it doesn't say consider, it says must in exercising those functions do so with the yeah. objective of contributing yeah, to the so achievement of sustainable development. My Lord, you're correct, my Lord. But the point, my Lord, is that sustainable development sub two, and then sub three, mitigating the impact of climate change, is simply one aspect of, yeah. of that. So it must be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, no, would you accept, or would you not accept, that sustainable development includes the needs of future generations? Well, well that's the that's the definition um, in the national policy framework, which the court said. Well, it's inherent in the Brundtland uh, definition, yeah. which is the common currency, at least in these proceedings, and wider still than that. So, well, it, it is. So the, the, answer, the, the answer has to be yes. Yes, it, it? Yes, well, it, yes, it's part of the definition of state. And do you accept that it includes having regard to the interests of children? Well, my lord, that's something that will obviously be addressing in June. Yes, you will. Yes, that's that's fair. Yes, yes, yes. You're coming back to that. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back. Certainly. Um, my lord, can I just turn to Brown C and FCA? And my lord, the key to this is the judgment. Can we just go to the judgment 653 and 654? Yes, it might just be worth having the provisions of the directive in front of us. Yes, my lord, that's in, that's in the same volume. I think we've got an open volume for the act here, volume 1. I think it's about 7. Unless you quote them in your notes, I don't know if you do. Yes, uh, that's tab seven. Tab seven. Well, it's probably article. We start with article five. So, page. Is there anything in the recyclables that is uh, germane to this point? Well, not that I'm drawing attention to. Presumably, there are regulations which implement this directive. Well, there are. We've, we've always uh, there are, but they are in the bundle. Yeah. Sorry to be pedantic. I mean, don't, don't take time now. It's actually the regulations in domestic law which are binding. Is that right? Yeah, well, the reason we've always focused in the submissions on this on the directive because the regulations really do almost word for word yes. take on this point. So the numbers are different. I understand. Uh, I understand. Uh, and well, you'll, you'll, come, you'll see that when um, Mr. Fleming makes his submissions on the Tuesday. Right. So, well, the key one is 5 2 that we saw yesterday. The report. Uh, much shall include uh, the information that may reasonably be required, taking into account current knowledge and methods of assessment, the contents and level of detail in the plan and programme, stage and decision making process, and the extent to which certain matters are more appropriately assessed at different levels in the process in order to avoid duplication and assessment. And well, by the way, that, that is a reference to, uh, I say, EIA. Because obviously SEA is at the strategic level policy, EIA follows the project. So what it's saying is there is a judgment to be reached at some point about what's the appropriate to assess at the SEA stage and what's best left to be assessed at the development stage. Um, and then, my lord, um, obviously the key um, provision that Mr. Wolf relied on was in Article in our, in our 1 is yeah. the environmental protection objectives established at international uh, level. Um, and one of the way the court deals with this then is 653. Four. We're just pausing before we turn to what the divisional court said. Uh, it may be you're about to deal with this point anyway. Um, but we're dealing here with 
objectives that are established at international level. Um, we're not dealing as such with policy or as such with legislation. No. We're dealing with objectives which have been established at international level. You are. But you're correct, my Lord, that the requirement to consider them is limited by Article 5 2. And what may be reasonably required. And, you, and the right approach legally to this would be, would it, that you apply to the judgment exercised by the decision maker under Article 5.2, which itself incorporates the requirement of reasonableness, the public law concept of reasonableness. That's my submission. Um, Is that what you submit? That's what my submission. Um, I that will be my submission when I deal with SEA on... Wednesday morning, Mr. Fleming is going to be arguing that it's not going to be reviewed here, that um, it's uh, an intensive form of review, a type of policy yes, review. But you adhere to the adhere classic uh, traditional Wednesday approach. Yes. Uh, and my Lord, our, our answer on this really mirrors the answer we've given on section 10 of our Paris, because if you go to the court's judgment at 653. 654, you'll see the court says we've, we've already pointed out the SE Direct only requires information to be applied on matters falling within the scope of Annex 1, insofar as the Secretary of State judges that to be reasonably required. Mr. Wolf accepts the judgment can only challenge these proceedings on conventional awareness of the grounds known to be a rationality. Well, he accepted that below. He said to yesterday he's no longer accepting that. He's now siding with Mr. Fleming, saying. <coughs> but leave that aside. 654. <coughs> as you've explained on the ground 12, and this is the main answer in relation to section 10, the targets in the Paris Agreement will need to be considered by the UK Government and Parliament to determine whether the carbon targets in the Act should be amended. The CCC has advised the Government it's possible that there may not need to be, but on any view, as Mr. Walker accepts, at some point the implications of the revised budget targets are for our domestic targets. And whether the latter should be amended at all, and if so, how it will be determined. <coughs> Only work on that matter currently in hand, the decisions have not yet been reached. In those circumstances, we do not think it can be said that the Secretary should act irrationally by not addressing the Paris Agreement in the SEA process. The same conclusion must apply to the complaint the AOS did not address internally working uh, on this subject. And um, well, we then have to go to 655, you'll see they refer to Ms. Stevenson's evidence, and that's where. Really, Mr. Wolf focuses his complaint um, in terms of his oral submissions. Could we go, please, to that evidence? Um, and I will, I'll give you the reference in front of the page. It's the supplementary bundle of the Friends of the Earth. Thank you. 
but it's chronologically incorrect. So he says this paragraph 3.128 is dealing with the scoping stage, which was March 16, and is referring to October 16 climate change. But when you look at 3.128, you'll see that Mr. Institute refers to the advice of the climate change committee that we've seen before. And then over the page, second line, the AOS has followed this advice and considered existing domestic food obligations as the correct basis for assessing the carbon impact uh, of uh, the project. Now, that's the AOS, not the scoping exercise, which took place at a time when the Paris Agreement wasn't even in force. The AOS was a process, an iterative process, that ran right through to June 18th. So this is evidence she's given about the whole AOS process, explaining why the decision was taken. And obviously this chimes with Caroline Lowe's view statement on Section 10 of course. And then she says, at this stage, it's not possible to consider what any future targets might be recommended by the climate change committee to meet the ambitions of the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement is a global target. What to understand that to assess a policy against it, you need to have it uh, nationally. Well, the language of ambitions is not necessarily the same as the language of obligations or objectives. Well, no, that's, that's, that's true, my lord, but when you come to what's reasonably required, the reason that Paris has been excluded is the point that's being made is that because it is a global target, that cannot be applied to an individual state or project in that way. It's not reasonable to try and carry out assessment against Paris as a treaty. You have to wait to see how Paris is calculated down before you can give any meaningful assessment. Well, is it not possible to discern in the Paris Agreement certain environmental protection objectives? Well, absolutely, but they are the same objectives that we set in the AOS, which is can look at the, if you look at the actual objectives of carbon, those issues are all around um, seeking to minimise or reduce the amount of carbon emissions in the project. The objective would be the same. So you say, do you, that the AOS objectives mirror those in the Paris Agreement? Well, well they, would not, they would not be changed by the Paris Agreement because well, if you look at them, where are they? Well, so they're in. Um, Hillingdon Supplementary Bundle 7. <coughs> We're approaching paper overload here, Mr. Marich. Yes, I think we've got to put some things away. <coughs> um, otherwise, we are going to. Yes. So if you go to page 593 in uh, Supplementary Bundle 7. say that um, to minimise carbon emissions carries the same uh, objective as one discerns in the parallel provisions of the Paris Agreement? Well, yes, because whether it's the power ultimately, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, the overall objective is to reduce carbon emissions. Now, it's true that Paris set a more ambitious <coughs> global target than that. Well, what was its objective underpinning that target or motivating that target? Well, the Paris Agreement. Yes. Well, well it was, it, it's to do with the things you've heard already from Mr. Crossley about the, um, the a more ambitious. Um, <coughs> Objective in terms of um, global temperature rise. That, that's what I'm beginning to feel the need to revisit the Paris Agreement. 
Which we haven't done. It's FOE. Should we put everything away then? Um, um, good idea, yes. Otherwise, um, so we need authority. It's a climate change authority. Tab 5, the FOE authorities. She emphasizes that steps must be taken as soon as possible. What do you say about that? Well, well it does, but it also, if you look at term two, mm. each party shall prepare, communicate, and maintain successive nationally determined contributions that it intends to achieve. The party shall pursue the next negotiation to the firm in achieving the objectives of such contributions. And on, similarly, Article 3, that's nationally determined contributions to the global response. And one of the whole structure of this agreement is about the nationally determined contributions. All the obligations that come from the state are phrased in that way. You say it's a stage process, that yes, there were the objectives and the ambitions, but they had to be thought about and determined nationally well, yes, before they could become effective. Before they could be in relation to this article, before they could provide any meaningful basis for assessment in, a, in an AOS. Is that right? I'm holding in front of me Annex 1 of the SEA directive. Annex 1 of the SEA directive? Yes, which I didn't put away. <laughs> I did. says environmental protection objectives established at international level, leaving out unnecessary words. When we look at um, the provisions in Articles 1, 2, 3, and 4 of the Paris Agreement, do they carry environmental protection objectives established at international level? They, they do, um, but they are. They do, including Article Two One A. Well, well, that is the objective. Well, the point that, that is the objective. Well, well, that is an objective of, of the, and it says in terms this agreement aims to. So that's the aim of the. Yes. Of so it's right to characterise, is it? Article 2.1a of the Paris Agreement as an environmental protection objective established at international level. Well, not one, we say, that it's reasonable to require an assessment of a project at national level. Well, again, Was the answer yes, but not one? Yes, one, one, one yes. Well, I, I, I did accept one of them. And to be clear, well, the, the point that we're making in the in Ursula's Twitter statement is not to deny that the Paris Agreement um, is an international agreement and that set, one that sets objectives. The point that we're making, and the point that was accepted by the provisional court, was a different point, which was we're not under an obligation to look at every environmental and protection objective in the NCA. We only have to look at those who are reasonably required. And the view that we took was that it's not possible in a meaningful way to apply these aims and objectives to an individual project in an individual until there has been, in the language of uh, this, this agreement, a nationally determined contribution and decisions about how that will actually achieve the global target. And well, that's one of the points the Division Court makes several times. It's simply not possible, and I show you the visit, to apply that global target in any meaningful way to the assessment of the aims and the project. It can't be done. It can't assess it against that global target, because it's a global target. The question is, what's the contribution of this country to that global target, and how at all would this project protect? Does it follow from that submission that a particular country could decide positively to approve a major infrastructure project? either knowing that it will make things worse, 
or not knowing one way or the other, because it hasn't considered the question, uh, because its a, its ambition or objective overall by 2050 is to achieve the global levels. Is that? Is that well, well I, su I, su I suppose so. I mean, we, I suppose so. But um, well, obviously, in terms of what we're focusing on, the SEA, the SEA is not concerned with. It doesn't dictate the result. Either grant or not grant. It's simply a process for how you assess uh, the grant. I mean, I understand that, but it might it might be said, I don't know, that if you don't know what this major infrastructure project is going to do vis-a-vis -vis your overall target, and, it, and in fact it makes things worse, then you're going to have to find savings and reductions elsewhere. Well, well that, that, that's, that's true in itself. I mean, of course, logically prior to that, mm. this is just the NPS. There is no development of Heathrow until they obtain a development consent order. And under 5.82, well, they've got to show they wouldn't have a material impact on the statute of which have now been amended to reflect that. I understand. Well, I'm slightly concerned about the time, which I've already overrun my time. Can I... Well, we've been asking you questions to explore your submissions. Well, um, can I turn to the plan? Just pause for a second. Um, are we moving on from yes, no, 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 SEA? Right, in which case, the first thing we should do, I think, is just clear the decks. Just, just pause for a second. If you would. Um, yes, sir. Very interesting. Um, how long do you think you need to well, develop well, these points already? In a way, we've probably already dealt with them this morning because I think if you saw the things I had in there, they really match the points I gave an answer to the reductions said that earlier today. So, my lord, if, if you're content, you don't, I would only emphasize maybe one or two points. Yes, but well, if you're content to do it in that way, um, I'm sure that. Uh, meets with our approval. Um, well, can I just ask you to, I did ask you to look at this earlier, paragraph 608, the entrenched policy. Can I ask you to look at this briefly, 615 and 642? 615. 615, that's the Yeah. national carbon cap. The cap is set in the Act. It's based upon the particular temperature limit. For the reasons we've given, the policy is entrenched and can only be changed through the statutory process. And then, well, similarly, if you go 642, did not suggest that government policy in Section 5 is restricted to the legislative obligations. 
although it includes them. So by the way, that Marvel's institutions are entrenched government policy. Indeed, Mr. Marici agreed with Friends of the Earth that this was a legislative centrepiece. We've seen that before. But he accepted that government policy also included, for example, policies within the APF. And when the ABA strategy is adopted, it will include policies within that. The international obligations of the science may be reflected in their own policies as well as in the final of 2008. Of course, policy cannot be inconsistent with legislation. But as long as these other policies are not inconsistent with statutory restrictions, they may be equally government policies. Together, these are the policies which transpose and reflect international commitments to develop the science through the prism of domestic political desire into domestic uh, law. Um, well, what the court is, is saying is that, and we did touch on this earlier, that in relation to targets, they are part of government policy and they are entrenched part of government policy, i.e. they can only be changed through the statutory provisions that we looked at uh, in the course of uh, yesterday. Uh, and therefore it's not correct, uh, I've been to it before, for Mr Crossland uh, to say um, that simply because it's been ratified or because the government has given a commitment that in the future it would take the advice of the CCC and consider whether these obligations in the statute, these um, restrictions should be amended, that that is government policy. Because the relevant government policy here is entrenched in the act. It is those targets. But Section 5A doesn't talk in terms of just entrenched policy. It says in terms that you should explain how government policy yes. generally it's relating probably, to mitigation. Absolutely correct. Well, that's why in 642, what the court is saying, and which will be my submissions on, is say I wasn't suggesting that that only captures entrenched statutory policies. It could capture other policy, like the APF, the aviation strategy. But what it can't do is capture something that's potentially different or inconsistent with your submission is that the targets only assume, uh, as it were, the clothing of policy once that is conferred upon them by legislation. Correct. Correct. That particular aspect of policy, the targets, because of the legislation, only becomes policy. Does one, all, Mr. Ritchie, does one also have to be slightly careful to bear in mind that policy can come in all shapes and forms? So, for example, you can have a policy against deportation. If certain factual circumstances are true, the Secretary of State will not deport. That, that's, in a sense, it, it, that's, that's an obligation, although in the form of a policy rather than a law. But you can also have a policy, for example, that it is your intention to introduce certain revised targets and it is your policy that that should be done in the form of legislation, it, it, it could, in due course. It could be, but of course that wasn't the policy. Mr. Crossland seeks to argue that was the policy. But the, the, the position of the government was, following the CCC's advice, that our current targets are potentially consistent. No, no, I'm sorry, it's meant, meant to be a point in your favour, actually. Yes. Uh, that, that one has to be very careful to, to say, well, what, what's the government policy? The policy could be, in principle, yes, we do, in, we do have these ambitions, we do have these objectives, but no, that they're not current obligations. Our intention is to invite Parliament to legislate in yes. the field. Well, that, that really does encapsulate what the policy position was. It was that this is something we have to be dealt with later on through an amendment the gap. So there wasn't a, it wasn't a policy that the Paris Agreement immediately comes in and has some application. It's something that would be considered an amendment. Yeah, so, so it's not your submission, as recorded at 642, in fact. It's not your submission that Section 5A <coughs> precludes reference to any non-legislative policy. It's just that in this particular context, the policy is to be found in the legislation. Correct. Yes, that's exactly correct. And government could have a policy along the lines of, this is quite difficult, our policy is to look at it more carefully before we proceed. Yes. Well, yes, and again, 
in a sense, that doesn't capture the impact. Um, what was going on in terms of the interactions with government and climate change continued in that, in that period was something that was going to have to be looked at more carefully. Um, but also, I won't, um, I won't trouble you with the other points in relation to Plan B. And at the very end, again, I won't trouble you with this one, but we do say the way we test in this case. But it, this is the mass energy uh, point, which is squarely made, I think, in your scope of knowledge. We refer you to four points <coughs> like to um, four as well, just because there is obviously a discretion <coughs> for any fishery to apply that type of fishing case. Uh, that's a proposition that sort of predates mass energy. Mass energy is really just an example of this point, setting out three circumstances which justified on the facts of that case a heightening of the text. And we say all those circumstances are also right. So the extract from Fordham goes with your note. And there is another note on our bench. Which is coming. Yeah. I think Chair Lord Mr. Singh asked for that, yes. I did. He did. And we're very grateful to Mr. Wolf for producing it. I think we'd found it already ourselves, but we're nonetheless grateful. Thank you. Well, also, unless I can assist you further, I'm sorry I am alone. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hunt. By the way, I appear for Central Airport. Heathrow is obviously the license operator of the airport and promoted the Northwest Runway scheme through the Airport Commission process. Uh, this is a very short slot, uh, 15 minutes, and so I'm, I'm going to uh, get straight uh, to the points if I may. Our yes. primary position, as I hope is, is clear, uh, is that the Divisional Court was right to refuse permission for FOE and the Earth, uh, and we would say for the reasons given in the judgments, and we support. Uh, the Secretary of State's reasoning in upholding the Divisional Court's uh, decision. Our secondary position, however, is, is in relation to relief. If the Court does find some legal error, then we say that relief should be refused, and we point to both the statutory duty and Section 31, just so that you know where uh, the Senior Courts Act is in the bundles, it's in the authorities' bundles, uh, Volume 1, Tab 2, no need to Take to that, you'd be very familiar well, we are with the high energy test. Yes. And, and in relation to the residual discretion, that clearly survives the 2015 uh, amendments to the Senior Courts Act. And one of the most recent decisions, my Lord, is, is one of your own in the Goring Parish Council case. That's also in the bundles. Again, just for your reference, it's Authorities Bundle 4 at tab 67 and paragraphs 47, 53, and 55 are perhaps. Uh, the most uh, uh, helpful. 47. 47, 53, and 55, um, uh, yeah. uh, my Lord, are, are helpful both on the statutory duty and on residual uh, discretion. Yeah, thank you. My Lord, the context for the uh, FOE uh, Plan B um, arguments are clearly founded in the decision, uh, in, in the uh, existence of the Paris Agreement at the time the decision was taken. Clearly, they also have to accept the CCC's advice that government should not amend the Climate Change Act. And the reasons for that, because it's not known how the broad objective, the well below two degrees objective in the uh, Paris Agreement, would be translated into a UK target, which is not expressed in terms of numbers of degrees, but uh, in, in uh, in, in very different terms against the 1990 baseline. And I draw attention to the fact, fact I'll come to perhaps in, in a few moments, that in, in Section 1 of the Climate Change Act, the, the target that is set is a net target. It is a net UK carbon account. So net zero is not zero, it is net zero. 
it allows for offsetting and matters um, of that sort. I'll touch on that um, point later. So the FOE uh, Plan B challenge amounts in effect to an allegation that the Secretary of State should in effect have anticipated at the date of the decision future events. He should have looked at uh, the, the policy, looked at the Paris Agreement and somehow anticipated what the climate change committee advice would be on how that should be translated into net UK carbon account uh, figures for uh, 2015. And we say that even if there was some error in the Secretary of State's uh, reasoning, uh, uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Singh explored uh, with my learned friend uh, section 5758 um, of the Planning Act and whether there was an appropriate explanation of the Secretary of State's thinking, I think, was the way it was put. We, we say even if there is found to be some flaw of, of that sort, and I give that simply as an example, we say that it is highly likely, using the Section 31 test, that the decision to designate the AMPS uh, would have been the same. And we say that for four principal reasons, and, and three of these very much piggyback on things that the Secretary of State has said in the submissions, and therefore I can be uh, relatively brief on them, I, I hope. The first is what I'll just summarise as the uh, paragraph 5.82 point, that the AMPS does require the determination of the DCO in the context of the UK's climate change obligations as they exist at the time. And it is important in my submission to understand sense the limits of a national policy statement. It is not setting out, nor does it ought to, UK climate change policy. That's the function of the aviation policy framework currently, or the future aviation strategy, and the Climate Change Act itself. What the AMPS does, it's, it sets a policy framework within which development projects are made brought forward, in this case the NWR, the Northwest Runway, uh, and in each of the sections in Section 5 of the uh, AMPS, it always sets out an introduction of what the applicant's assessment has to contain, what the mitigation is, and what the decision-making is. And so we focused rather on Section 582, but if, if I can invite you just very briefly to look at uh, one of the other paragraphs. It's in Bundle 5, it's the AMPS. Turn to paragraph 576, and you'll see from um, page 2477 in that bundle, so it's bundle 5, tab 14, and you'll see that structure that I've described, carbon emissions, introduction, uh, applicant's assessment, mitigation, and then decision making. And, and if I just look at paragraphs 576, the applicant's assessment, it tells us that pursuant to the terms of the environmental impact assessment regulations, the applicant should undertake an assessment of the project as far as the environmental state to include an assessment of likely significant climate factors. The applicant should provide evidence of the climate impact of the project included in Baltic carbon, both in construction and operation, such that it can be assessed against the government's carbon obligations, including but not limited to carbon budgets. The applicant should quantify the greenhouse gas impacts before and after mitigation to show the impacts of the proposed mitigation. This will require emissions to be split between the traded sector and the non-traded sector emissions and for a distinction to be made between international and domestic aviation emissions. So very clear that international aviation is uh, it is included there and that we have to inform the Secretary of State. And it's in that context, not just that context, but partly in that context that we get to the paragraph 5. 82, which is in the decision-making section. I won't uh, read that because you've been taken to that uh, many, many times. But I do draw attention, uh, as Melanie Friend did, in relation to paragraph 582, the way in which the Divisional Court dealt with this at paragraph 631. That's the paragraph with those many Roman numeral uh, sub, um, sub parts. I don't need to take you to it, but we say that analysis of the uh, paragraph is correct, uh, which includes that the judgment is made at the date 
the application is determined and also makes it clear that whether a particular project can and will be delivered against the UK's climate change obligations is a matter for the DCO uh, stage. So, my Lord, we say in that context it is uh, highly likely that the decision to designate, even if there was, for example, inadequate explanation of, of what the government was thinking, uh, would be exactly the same because the ANPS was clearly and deliberately drafted to allow for future changes in climate change obligations. S -s -s Secondly, whether there is uh, a material effect on the UK's climate change obligations is clearly to be taken at the time of the DCO decision. And importantly, my lords, uh, in the light of or in the context of the particular project and its mitigation. And any decision we know will now be taken in the context of the targets that reflect the Paris Agreement. And my lords, I do make the point, lest it sort of go and say there's no uh, suggestion here or indeed evidence that there can be no expansion of airport capacity in the UK consistent with net zero. Um, that's very clear and I emphasize that point again, it is net zero and you will remember um, um, Mr. Crossan was asked a question about other international obligations and he pointed to Corsia um, as an example and you may not be familiar with Corsia but if I can just briefly uh, point you to what that is. It's in the Plan B Earth supplementary bundle <coughs> and it's at page uh, 62. That document starts at page 59. It's the government's response to the consultations on Air Force National Policy Statement. And if you look at paragraph 819 just and a second. Um, the document we're looking at here. Is it page 62? Yes, yes, I've got the page, but the document we're in is... Um, <coughs> yeah, so this is the government response to the consultations That's on the APN ANPS. Have you got a page numbered 62? Yes, yes, no, I, I found it. I just wanted to be sure what I was looking at. I do apologize. Yes. And um, I, I, I won't read all the way uh, through paragraph 819. You can clearly read around that. But if you look towards the middle of the paragraph, it says the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, of course, yeah, the thing that Mr. Costner was referring to, is the first worldwide scheme to address CO2 emissions in any single sector and will be a first important contribution in the sector to meet the long-term goals set out by the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement to pursue efforts to limit global temperature increases to well below 2, uh, 2 degrees centigrade. And as I say, I, uh, I'm not trying to be over-selected. I just have a very limited time slot. Well, we did look yesterday with Mr. Crosland at both 818 and 819. You did. Um, just and, what and was so causing, I'm sorry, Tom, is the date of the government's response. I know it's in the chronology, but can you remind us? Um, I'm not sure I can or can do it. June 18th. Yes, it's June. June of uh, 18. 18, 2018. And uh, the simple point that I'm making there is obviously the judgment as to whether a particular scheme can meet carbon uh, uh, obligations at the time the decision will be taken is, 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 is not straightforward. There will be a number of factors. Mitigation, including uh, things such as Corsia, may be um, part of that overall metrics, and that's why it's entirely right that the ANPS was drafted in the way it was. And we say even if there had been some technical flaw in, in, in reasoning, um, we say it's highly likely that exactly the same um, uh, uh, drafting would have, have, have uh, come forward because it's clearly right. Now, my Lord, I'm um, nearly through my time, so I will just point briefly to two other things. We also rely for the highly likely uh, argument on uh, section 104 uh, of the Planning Act and the ability to take into account 
various other things, I will simply piggyback on Mr. Barici's submissions on that, again, because those things can be taken into account through the DCO process, we say, again, it's highly likely that the Secretary of State uh, would have come to exactly the same decision. Um, if I may put it like this, ditto uh, Section 6 of the Planning Act, which provides a mechanism to um, review the AMPS. Uh, we say that no review is, in fact, necessary on these grounds because of Paragraph 5.82, the fact that the AMPS, as you uh, um, uh, put it, in effect, embeds uh, the climate change uh, targets, but the mechanism uh, exists and is another reason that if post-designation material does come up, the Secretary of State uh, can, where appropriate, look at that. I move briefly then to um, two uh, uh, points which I'll take uh, shortly. The first of them is that having a clear policy framework for airport expansion in the southeast is clearly, we say, in the public interest. The 2007 White Paper, which um, ultimately uh, led, or was one of the things that led to the Planning Act 2008, identified as one of the mischiefs uh, of the previous legislation that was to be remedied, was uh, the absence of a clear policy framework for airport development. You can find that as a quote at um, the judgment, uh, the original court judgment at paragraph 22. I won't take you to it, I suspect it is uh, absolutely common ground, but that was one of the mischiefs uh, that the Planning Act and the national policy statements were intended to uh, remedy. Uh, clearly, in designating the AMPS, the Secretary of State concluded that the policy statement is in the public interest. Indeed, the Secretary of State uh, explicitly did so as part of the IROPI exercise. See the Airport National Policy Statement of Paragraph 1.32. So 1.32, the Secretary of State explicitly as part of IROPI makes it clear that the statement uh, 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 and the project is in the national interest. Next, I make the point under this heading that it needs to be remembered that the process leading to the adoption of the AMPS has been a very long <coughs> and involved one. The Airport Commission itself was established in September 2012. That's in the uh, agreed uh, chronology. And obviously, the thinking leading to that went back uh, further, and Heathrow Airport and many other parties would be hugely prejudiced by having to go back through the process in circumstances where the Paris Agreement is now reflected in the UK climate change target, and through paragraph 588, the decision-making will have to reflect that, and it would be hugely prejudicial to uh, 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 Heathrow Airport, but others uh, to have to go back to the beginning and to quash the AMPS, we say, would leave a huge policy vacuum on airport expansion. The last point I will briefly make is just very briefly to, to respond to, to Mr. Crossan's points of, uh, in Plan B's supplementary skeleton. This was, in effect, referring to the, what was said to be the Secretary of State's concession. Well, whether or not the Secretary of State made a concession in not arguing relief, um, Hal certainly didn't. It's then suggested that because we didn't leap up and, and, and take a different position, that in some way we should be uh, stopped from um, arguing this. It needs to be remembered that the applications for disclosure related to a very wide type, uh, a range of materials of the consideration of Paris within different government departments. And I hope. Um, it's clear that that is simply not material to the submissions I'm making. It has no bearing on whether, in paragraph 582, uh, the, 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 the effect of uh, the Paris Agreement uh, is now reflected and to be taken into account in a DCO decision. So, of course, we weren't going to leap up and intervene in what was a dispute between Plan B uh, and the Secretary of, of, of State. But we emphasise the point that uh, Para 582 does mean that the Paris uh, Agreement 
will now be taken into account or through the process or, or the, the means of the Climate Change Act will now be taken into account in the decision-making process. And therefore, um, in the round on this, we say that it is uh, highly likely that the decision of the Secretary of State to designate the AMPS in the form that it did would have been substantially the same. That's the form of words in Section 31. Substantially the same uh, if the Secretary of State had taken um, Paris and, and then all the other things contended for by FOE and Plan B um, into account. My Lord, I'm very conscious that that has been taken at something of a counter, but um, I think I've only just got over my limit. Well, thank you very much. My Lord, thank you. I understand, Chris. Thank you very much. <coughs> yes, Mr. Wolf, you go first. My team took the opportunity over night to just do a short note picking up on um, the points Mr. Ricci uh, made yesterday, which I hope you'll Thank you very much. Um, um, there are also bits to add to that um, as I go through that, but also bits to take, uh, deal with in relation to his helpful notes, which I'll do my own thing. All right. Um, well, my first uh, homework was to do with Wales, uh, stuff which I think is now a lot on board. Thank you for that. Um, Wales, well, Wales is a very interesting one. Um, and I think it's worth noting that the terms of our note, um, we remind the court that the central issue here is the legality of the decision to designate the AMPS on the date that was done, the date of June of last year, and that cannot be affected by subsequent events, as indeed the central state himself was paid to put out in his skeleton below, and that includes amendments to the Section 1 of the Climate Change Act uh, and the possibility of the central state to the Section 6 review, let alone on any particular time scale, or the possibility that a DCO application will be made, let alone on any particular time scale. None of those things, or any anything else, can affect the legality of the decision to designate. That matters because at the time of designation, <coughs> my paragraph three, no assumptions could be made about how and when the Climate Change Act targets might be amended, or whether a DCO application might come forward before that happened. The sequencing was completely up in the air. The AMPS had to cope with the possibility that a DCO application might come forward before the Climate Change Act had caught up with the emerging thinking coming from the international arena, which indeed it's done that, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, or other impacts such as on CO2, uh, and in any event, the development of the timeline going beyond 2050. None of those things could be assumed in the designation process. Over page paragraph four, that in turn matters because the Secretary of State is simply wrong to say there is not a, content about the, sorry, a complaint about the content of the AMPS or the DCO check itself. That content is at the heart of our challenge. The practical concern which follows from Friends of the Earth is seen throughout the AMPS provisions, the, the carbon emissions and climate change. That includes, but is not limited to paragraph 5.82, which sets the birth of control test. Can I just pause for a minute? Well, our concerns um, traverse across the sections of the AMPS dealing with carbon and climate change, um, including for the reasons that Mr. Humphreys has identified, because that is entirely focused on, on carbon and a particular approach to assessing it. So, whilst 582 obviously is another of the points, because that's the DCO test as it's formulated, the foothills of getting there are equally important. So, our concern is across the board. Yeah. The concern about that, um, and this is the rest of paragraph 5. Um, is that it doesn't just embrace the implications of the Paris Agreement or post Paris thinking. And post Paris thinking is important, and I'll come back to that. It's the stuff that was um, in the minds of government in the February, March, April, May period of 2018, which led to the concession. Um, none of that equally embraces consideration of non CO2 emissions, and it in effect sets an artificial cut off of 2050 on how the CO2 emissions of the project, which runs to 2086, are to be considered for climate change purposes. Come back to that point when I do a list of the issues that went on time. The artificial constraint which within 5.82 as framed matters because, as we know from Secretary of State's concession on discretionary relief, even in relation to Paris considerations, uh, an appreciation that went wider than the Climate Change Act targets could have led to a different AMPS across the board in the way it deals with carbon and climate change. Well, that concession is very important, not just, and I make this nod now to Mr. Humphreys, but more generally because it's a recognition that whatever the complexities of Paris are, whatever needs to be done or needed to be done to give effect to Paris domestically, the Secretary of State accepts, for that, that purpose, 
and that those things could have made a difference to the AMPS. If you put the other way around, he doesn't say it's highly likely the AMPS would have been the same. And that means not just as to the fact of the AMPS, but also as to its content. Well, it's kind of difficult to remind you, but I would like to go back to my feeling because the judge was concerned that my concession was recorded accurately, and that's why he made me plead it. I don't accept the way it's just been put, so I would like to ask him to go back to the pleading which the judge directed me to make, so it's a bit what, what my position actually was. Right, you, you, you've got the reference to it there, Lords. We, we say the concession was properly made, and Mr. Mr. Um, Crossman's explained to the circumstances of how it came about. It was as a rebuttal, if you like, to uh, an application for disclosure of materials, because we were concerned that a discretionary argument would be made. So we, shall remind, we shall remind ourselves of remind the, the exact terms of pleading. Um, my paragraph 7. The legal point, then, is that Section 10.2 and 10.3a are not blinkered or constrained in the way that the Secretary of State would have it. And in any event, and the two run together, the SEA directive expressly mandates consideration of international requirements or obligations for such set objectives. Um, Lords, can I just pause for a moment on 10.2 and 10.3a while we're there? They are cast in very wide terms, let me just remind you of that, particularly the sustainable development objective, which is a mandatory objective, clearly apt to embrace all the things we're talking about, and even within it, the subsection 10.3a, it is entirely widely cast. <coughs> well, paragraph 8, recall, if you would, the Secretary of State's stance before the Divisional Court, including in relation to his amended detailed grounds of resistance. This is important on how the Secretary of State saw the role of Paris in this process. And Lords, can I take you to it? I'm afraid I've scrambled the quote of the judge's email, which doesn't matter. It's in our bundle, supplementary bundle, at page 164. I don't think you saw it yesterday. You saw um, an email in a similar series yesterday from Mr. Crossland. I think we did. We did, did you see it? I think you saw yeah. us through Crossland's email. Well, I, I recall looking at the judge's email. Yes. Um, can, can I just take you back to another desk because I just have scrambled the quotation? Yes, yes, yes. 164. 164. Thank you, yes. How is it said that such matters do not need to be taken into account? By way of example, is it said that the matters referred to in the ground challenge were legally irrelevant as a matter of construction of the section of the 2008 Act? That's the question. And the answer to that, the answer to that we get from all of this matters, is in the Secretary of State's pleadings. I won't take you back to those, but you've got um, in the second indent in my paragraph eight. Actually, I'm not sure we did look at this. No, I don't, I don't think we did. No. We, looked at, we looked at another email. Did you look at Mr. Crossland's email? That's right. The question is posed very clearly. Are you saying it was legally irrelevant as a matter of the 2008 Act? And the amendment to the pleading, which I've given you in the quote, I won't take time taking you back to the body of the document, is um, the clear intention of Parliament being that consideration should be given only existing domestic legislation and policy commitments in relation to mitigation of and adaptation to climate change. So the answer was, yes, it is legally irrelevant. You do have to ignore it because of the law. <coughs> and Lord, that stance was maintained by the Secretary of State, albeit slightly developed thinking, before the court. And you saw that, I took this to you yesterday, paragraph 641 of the judgment where they characterised Mrs. Marucci's submissions as the Secretary of State being required to ignore, ignore, that was the word the judges used repeatedly. But they didn't accept that? They didn't accept it. Mm -hmm. That was Mr. Marucci's point. The reason I'm coming to this one all is how you then understand the Secretary of State's uh, evidence, which is what we should only get to. The, the court didn't accept it, absolutely right, but that was the Secretary of State's position. That matters, that matters. Um, we then see what uh, something taken from Mr. Uh, Crossland's uh, pleading, the parallel pleading, as to what the Secretary of State said he actually did, and this is quoted in our paragraph 9, in response to Mr. Crossland, the Secretary of State says, he did not ignore the Paris Agreement, or that there would be emerging material in the government evidencing developing thinking and simplification, but it was concluded that such material should not be taken into account, i.e. it was not relevant, since it did not form an appropriate basis on which, upon which to formulate the policies contained in the AMPS. Now, that has to be read, that has to be read, as does the Secretary of State's evidence, with the stance he was taking at the time, in other words, legally required to ignore. Legally required to ignore. So the explanation of why it wasn't taken into account was because we were legally required to ignore it. 
That then was the base on which the Secretary of State was proceeding, and the Lord's witness statement had to be read on that basis. Civil servants, we have to assume, were proceeding on the basis of the understanding of law which the Secretary of State had identified and explained at the time. Namely, that as a matter of law, we should only get Climate Change Act targets, budgets, and not with Paris matters which were legally irrelevant. The Lords, you saw yesterday, you saw yesterday um, uh, 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 one of Ms. Lowe's witness statements. I'm not sure you've seen the other one. Um, the other one, I think, can I just ask you to turn it up? Well, I haven't referenced it in the notes. It's in Bundle 6, Hillingdon, at page 52314. I hope it's the right page. And in that witness statement, paragraph 47. I'm sorry, the reference again. 5234.14. Five, two, three, four, <coughs> so this is this is a section where the witness is specifically responding to our claim, and that's the heading above paragraph 42. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. Give me the page. 523.14. 523. Sorry. I was in the wrong place. Yes, I'm sorry. So, so the heading about paragraph 42, you see this is specifically a response to our and Mr. Crossford's claim. And we then go to 47. And at the top of the uh, following <coughs> page, facing page, beyond the italicised quotes, I would not dispute that the IPCC distribute draft versions of its report to the government as part of its review process. However, so this is an emerging thinking point, this is irrelevant to the lawfulness of the AMPS, which was correctly assessed against existing legal obligations. Sorry, where are you reading? Uh, paragraph 47, yeah. beyond the italicised quote. Oh, right, sorry, yeah. Gotcha. This matter, so that's the emerging thinking point, is yeah. irrelevant to the lawfulness of the AMPS, which was correctly assessed against existing domestic legal obligations. Well, she has to be taken to be saying that on the basis of the Secretary of State's understanding of the legal position. That matters, that matters, we'll come to this a bit later on, because that was not an evaluation against some conception that there was a wide discretion, and this was a discretionary exercise. It was simply an application of the law. And you said it was a misdirection of law. Well, uh, we said it was a misdirection of law, but... but um, uh, in terms of the evidential points, she is proceeding, or she was proceeding, on the basis of that understanding of the law. And so that can't be an answer to a proposition that says, here was the Secretary of State exercising some discretion that he knew he had, or he thought he had, because he didn't think he had it. You say that the Secretary of State never applied his mind to this because he was headed off at the pass exactly right. by a misapplication, of misunderstanding of the law. Exactly right. Right. Well, the submission is there was no, the, the, the evidence um, demonstrates that there was no exercise of discretion. The evidence read in context. Uh, the evidence is, is uh, thin, but it has to be read in context, that's the point. But that is the proposition. That is the proposition. Um, the other thing Secretary of State then identifies obstacles, and I slightly lost track of them, but I think I've um, got the, the, the principles right. Obstacles he identifies to, to our submissions. The first obstacle, he said, as an unincorporated international agreement, Paris could have no domestic effect. This will be incorporation by the back door, given that this is not about human rights and there is no legislative ambiguity. And he says, we have to show a legal pathway, his words, for Paris to come into play. Of course, we say there are several legal pathways. First of all, there is the SEA Directive, which specifically mandates consideration of environmental protection objectives established in international law. And, and importantly, I'll come to this in the SEA point, it requires an explanation of how those be taken into account in the preparation of the report. Um, and Lord, that is plainly apt to catch unincorporated agreements. Indeed, if the SEA Directive were only concerned with incorporated agreements, it would need only to refer to domestic and EU law objectives. It wouldn't need to refer to international ones. So that's plainly apt to catch unincorporated ones. Um, and plainly, a consideration through the SEA process could have led to a different 5.82, for example. 
Secondly, the second pathway is through Section 10, a very widely cast objective of sustainable development, and within that, Section 10.3a, the desirability of mitigating climate change, mandatory consideration, those are plainly pathways for consideration of the Paris Agreement, even as an agreement, even as an agreement. But the point goes beyond that, because even if somehow Section 10 didn't allow for consideration of Paris as an agreement, what we have to look at is not just Paris, but also the thinking that goes around it and comes from it, which is a recognition of the increased desirability of mitigating climate change. So even if you don't look at Paris as if you were, if you like, as a legal text, if you simply look at it as a recognition in the international sphere of an enhanced um, uh, uh, mandate, enhanced pressure, and enhanced need to do something about climate change, it still comes in through 10.3.2 and 10.3.a. In, in practical terms, how were the government supposed to do that? Well, um, well I, I come back up. So in practical terms, what we say a manifestation of that might be um, it is a recognition um, that the assessment within the AMPS process is not limited to carbon, is not limited, as you've seen, to 2050 horizon, um, and looks at a bolder aspiration. So that would feature in various places in the AMPS where it talks about what needs to be assessed and considered. And in 5.82, as to what the development control test would be, because the development control test is narrowly focused, as we've seen, on carbon, uh, the Climate Change Act targets and budgets, that test could have been wider. But in a sense, well, all I really need to do is go back to the Secretary of State's concession, which is to say, consideration of Paris and the emerging thinking in early 2018, because that was the context in which the concession was given, could have led to a different ANPS. We don't need to rewrite the ANPS. Not, we're not here to rewrite the ANPS. We simply have to explain that it might have been different in a relevant way, and that's the effect of the concession. But well, well, just to, re to express that point, um, the whole, the whole reason I took you through the chronology and showed you those dates in the early part of 2018, when the IPCC report was in draft before government and the government was commissioning work for the Climate Change Committee, is to show that it's not just about the text of Paris, it's also about an in, in enhanced recognition of the desirability of mitigating climate change, happens to be manifested in and uh, 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 judicialised, if you like, or legislated for in Paris, but it's not the only, that's not the only show in town. So that's why there are at least... Um, Conceptually different pathways to get to that place. And you'd add the WWF to that as well. Well, that, that, that simply um, enhances the understanding of sustainable development. That's that's um, yeah. Um, so is it a separate pathway or not? Is it um, number four? No, because it comes in through the prism of sustainable development. It comes in through. Uh, I think they put their arguments, and we and we in a sense understand it this way as how you understand sustainable development as a um, emerging and evolving by reference to international law concept, to go back to the point where the Lord has made yesterday, which is not statutory defined in this country. So we haven't got the Welsh statute. We have to come from those principles. Um, second obstacle, this is over the page. Um, uh, the Secretary of State says that the Climate Change Act has an inbuilt mechanism to give effect to international obligations. Um, we say that's no answer, um, because those processes and those mechanisms are about changing targets and budgets for the whole economy, if you like, the whole society, they don't preclude focus on Paris or implications of Paris in the context of a development control process, which is what 10.3 specifically allows for. Um, and and well, anyway, anyway, this is paragraph 16, the fact that the target has now been amended can't be an answer to that, not least because it can't affect the legality of the day, but because it hasn't been amended to affect um, some of the other things about which we express concern, namely non-CO2 impacts and the longevity point. On the non-CO2 impacts, can I just draw your attention to a document in Mr. Crossland's bundle, if I may. Um, it, it's on page 74 of that bundle. explains that the report was commissioned by the Department of Transport but hasn't been adopted by it. So you obviously need to see the disclaimer, um, but he's obviously an expert in the position. And if you go to the penultimate paragraph that starts the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement is a temperature-based target and therefore implies inclusion of all emissions that affect climate, 
aviation has significant non-CO2 impact, uh, impacts on oxides of nitrogen, etc. So, so the proposition that somehow the Climate Change Act um, amendment that postdates designation has given effects to Paris is, is simply not a complete answer. It's given partial effects to Paris. So even if you could look to post designation effects, that would not be an answer. Um, obstacle three was the Climate Change Committee's advice of October 2016. So the point forgive, about me, forgive me, Mr. Wolf. Just, just, uh, uh, Paris, does, does that look at the post-2050 horizon? Um, well, it, it contemplates what needs to be done in the second half of the century. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, but um, I'll pick up the point about horizons in due course, because our time point is not limited to Paris. It's the breach um, over uh, narrows our argument, and I'll show you how that happens in the back. Um, but was the, the 2016 advice of the Climate Change Committee, that had been given um, in the back end of 2016. What we know, and again the concession illuminates this point, is that what was emerging in the early part of 2018 was leading to potential changes to that. So the Climate Change Committee's advice um, was obviously the statutory advice for the purpose of amending the Act, but it didn't foreclose wider considerations, particularly in a period where, as it were, everybody knew that the game was up in the early part of 2018. That's the problem, because they knew the game was up or changing at the point of the designation. But the Climate Change Act process hadn't caught up with that. As I said at the beginning, the NPS had to cope with whatever time sequence flowed from that. On your submission, Mr Wolf, might one possibility be, if, if things were done lawfully, on your submission, I'm not saying I agree with it, but if things were done lawfully on your submission, might one outcome be actually, not that we have a different ANPS, but that we should not have an ANPS on this issue right now, because we should pause well, and um, think about this very carefully in the light of overall global strategy. Well, um, uh, 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 that might be an outcome, um, uh, might indeed be an outcome, and no doubt my class would be delighted by that outcome, but it's not, it's not our, our case is limited to that possibility. Um, uh, the effect of the um claim if successful would be to quash the ANPS. Well, the Lord, yes, I don't, I'm not, in all or part, I think that, that in would all be In all or part? That's a, that maybe a well, choice. that's for perhaps a discussion. Um, but um, the effect of any such relief would, would necessarily be in the light of the court's judgment. Yes, and, that, and that's why I don't propose to make submissions on relief because well, we don't would, know. Would be a pause of some duration. Yes, if, if that's, yes, inevitably. But I, I, I apprehend my Lord's question went rather further than that. Yes. But I think the question of whether, that, that I think if I've answered my Lord's question, it would be, that would be a question of the Secretary of State on reflection in the light of a question rather than anything that the court I, could I was trying to put myself, I was, forgive me, I was trying to put myself back in the minds of the decision makers at the relevant time in the, in the process leading up to 20, June 2018, just trying to understand what your submission is. And I was wondering if, uh, even let, let, let's accept for the moment, and I'm not saying that they're right, the Secretary of State is right, that this is all inchoate, to use my terminology rather than his, and, and therefore it was not clear, wasn't certain. What was going to happen? Was the Climate Change Committee going to advise that we should have new legislation with revised targets to reflect Paris? But is it part of your submission that even if that were accepted, if you were properly taking into account Paris and the thinking around Paris, as you've called it, one outcome might have been, hang on, this is not the right time to be giving the go-ahead to a project like this. We've all got to pause and think about. Well, well that, that's absolutely right. With that, um, I don't think that necessarily meant that an, an, an ANPS couldn't have been made. I suppose I don't want to argue against myself because right. you have an, an ANPS that is less determinative. determinative because ANPSs generally can be either very stand back in policy terms, or they can be very focused on a particular development and set to the test. So this is really the latter category. So you could have had an ANPS that yes, I see. set things off without it being this one, or you could have had a version of this one that set different. Approaches to climate change. There's different, uh, 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 could be different rational policy responses to the conundrum that I think I'm understanding. Yes. Um, then, then the proposition is uh, this is uh, 
page 5, the section 104 process, plus the section 104 reference to international obligations, uh, safety valves save the day. Um, we say not, so safety valves can't make the AMPS lawful in the first place. Um, my Lord, also, second bullet point, the existence of that safety valve rather implies that the NPS will be designated to comply with the national obligation in the first place. Otherwise, otherwise, you have the proposition of an NPS which doesn't comply being made and, and then being ignored or set aside in a statutory way through Section 104. That can't be the legislative intent. That would be a, a very odd result. So, if anything, 1044 um, implies compliance with international obligations at, at the making stage. Obstacle five, um, Paris Agreement imposes no obligations. When you say, I'm so sorry, and uh, I appreciate that you're going as reasonably speedily as you can to make these submissions, but just going back to the point you've just shared with us, um, this, is, this goes to what I've called the blank sheet of paper stage, the, the very, yes, I suppose the it very does. first stage. Is that right? Um, well, I suppose it does, but it also goes beyond that, because um, what, what, all we're saying is um, that the, the 104 safety valve, that's my word, in, in the DCO making stage, which recognises that you can depart from an NPS because that would lead you to breach international obligations, um, in my submission, rather implies that the NPS should have been compliant with international obligations in the first place. Otherwise, you'd end up with an odd situation, which is you start off making an NPS which doesn't comply, and then you have to deal with it through the safety valve. That's really the end of the point. Yes, I suspect it's, it's, it's a variant on the same theme. It may well be. It may well be. Um, but on Obstacle 5, the Paris Agreement imposes no obligations on individual states, um, leaves to their discretion. Again, my lords, um, you've seen uh, what Paris does impose as, a, as an obligation, even if it's simply um, setting uh, high level objectives and, and, and giving timescales for them. Um, we simply say again, the Secretary of State's concession on discretion rather undermines all of that because they recognise that thinking on Paris could have led to a different NPS. They're not saying, they're not saying um, Paris, if you like, is drafted in such a way that nothing could have been done to lead to a different NPS. That must be the effect of the, of the uh, concession. But Lords, I've taken that very quickly because of the time. So I have got some more points to make, but I hope you'll be able to read them such more detail as there is in, in the report. Thank you. My Lords, picking that up, Mr. Marici's. Um, Note, if I may, just picking up some of the points within that. First of all, his future events point. I think he misunderstood our submission. Um, our, our concern, it's the one I've just identified, um, was illustrated, if you like, um, by the possibility of different sequencing or whatever sequencing came with the detail application and amendment, and the possibility, now it seems to be a reality, that the Climate Change Act amendments didn't fully reflect Paris. So that, that's the future events point. Um, well, Lord, over the page at, at his little Roman one at the top of the page, um, he jumps straight in by defending the legality of the uh, AMPS by reference to what's happened since. He says this, concern that the claimants that Heathrow expansion should be set by the Paris Agreement will be via Pirate 582 because of the amendment, because of the amendment to the Climate Change Act. That is a straightforward reliance on a post-designation event to try and cure the obvious illegality in the AMDS. <coughs> well, then picking up section 104, again, he relies on the safety valve of section 104, made one point about that. We say the existence of a safety valve, section 104 is an example of it, is no answer to getting the AMPS right in the first place, not least because the AMPS sets such an obvious framework target here, sorry, framework decision uh, uh, threshold in 5.82. Um, imagine, for example, we got to a DCO uh, and um, objectors sought to rely on Paris-related materials as a section 104 point, um, either as a chain or, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, the developer, Mr. Alfred's class, would be jumping up and down and saying, this is not new stuff, this was all around before, it was all foreseen in 2016, their case would immediately flip round um, and 104 would not be an answer. None of those safety valve propositions is an answer to getting the AMPS right. And if, as it does, it sets a go-no-go -no -go test on climate change, getting that test right. But to take the rule on just a single point, it needs to set such a test. But given that it has, the test has to be framed properly. Essentially, well, the same points apply to the Section 6 arguments. 
the safety valve of a possible Section 6 review is no answer to getting the AMPS right in the first place. And also, of course, that Section 6 review process anyway needs to get the law right. At the moment, the Secretary of State's understanding we say is wrong. Um, but that, again, that can be no answer. And I just remind you, without taking through the detail of it, of the statutory constraints on a review. And again, potential issues about whether the trigger for the review is, is one that couldn't have been anticipated. Well, Lord, then picking up the faux case on page three of Mr. Meritchie's notes and diving straight to his paragraph seven, which is on page four, Brown A7 and Hurst, um, I ask you, um, I'm usually just to turn up Hurst because it is just worth looking at it. Um, it's in the Climate Change Bundles at Tab 21. It, it is Lord Brown as previously canvassed. I'm sorry, which? Uh, Tab sorry. 21 in the Climate Change Legal Material. Right, right. right. Uh, at 218. 218, page 2, uh, sorry, by letter G, paragraph 7. The quote, there will be some matters so obviously material to a decision on a particular project that anything short of direct consideration from private sectors would not be in accordance with the intention of the Act. We are here looking at a statutory obligation to do something with the objective of sustainable development. We are here looking within that at a mandatory consideration of mitigating the desire to mitigate climate change. It is hard to imagine something more obviously material to those things than the Paris Agreement and the implications of it. Sorry, where were you reading from? Um, it's, it's the indented quote by letter G on 2A. The intention of the Act, the intention of this Act, is to focus on the desirability of mitigating climate change through the prism of sustainable development or in the context of sustainable development. It is hard to imagine a more perfect example of that applying than here in the context of Paris and the implications of it. I think I've got to try and paraphrase what my Lord Lord Justice said earlier in the morning, but that is. If you take the person off the street and say, what is the issue around climate change, they would have said the Paris Agreement. I think I said the reasonable person. No, the reasonable person. Mm. <laughs> well, we, we assume the reasonable person. <laughs> Rather than the cantankerous, <laughs> or whatever it may be. Um, so we say, you can't imagine anything more obviously material. Um, over the page, page five, the top of the page, um, the evidence... Um, uh, so this is Caroline Lowe's evidence. I've shown you how that has to be understood. I took you to the uh, second witness statement. We've got the two different witness statements. They have to be understood, as I explained 20 minutes ago, in the context of the Secretary of State's legal understanding of the time. He simply did not understand himself to have a discretion. Therefore, she cannot be uh, understood as explaining a lawful exercise of that discretion. So whether you put this before the obviously material or the other way around, um, even if it's not obviously material, and there was nonetheless a discretion, there is no lawful exercise of that discretion in this case. Reasons, paragraph 11, our case. Um, can I just ask you to turn to um, uh, 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 Call Bundle 1, tab 3, it's the reference to our skeleton. Uh, and paragraph 45B. those words beyond breaking point in that submission. That's his sub five of that page. Then as to the substance, his answer, paragraph 15, um, he says in relation to non-CO2, it is too uncertain. Sorry, where are you? Where are you I'm now? looking at his 15 sub one. In any event, the points are bad ones. On non-CO2, he says it's too uncertain 
That may, may have made it difficult to assess the purpose of the appraisal of sustainability. It didn't mean that it wasn't something that couldn't be included and needed to be included um, within the 582 appraisal or in the elements that led up to that point, in other words, what you assess against. Difficulty of assessment is not an answer when, in an NPS, you are framing an assessment criterion. You don't just say, this is hard, therefore we're going to ignore it, particularly when it is of the magnitude and severity that we have here. Difficulty of assessment is, is a common problem, yes. you say, across a whole range of yes. different... You don't then say, we're not going to include it in the, in the evaluation, we're going to close our ears to it, or our eyes to it. And yet that's what the AMPS does. So we say difficulty of assessment is not an answer on that point. It then may then, mean, as my Lord has said, you might need to pause well, that may be a, and take stock. That may, be a, that may be one way of dealing with it. Because it's so difficult. That may be one way of dealing with it. Or, or make clear that as and when the DCO comes to be considered, which may be next week or in 10 years' time, under the policy, um, whatever the current state of understanding of non-CO2 has got to at that point, you have to take it into account deal with it as best you can, without somebody needing to come along and raise one of the safety valve considerations. Well, I'm very conscious of time. I, I will be about less than five minutes more, and I appreciate Mr. Crossland has got to go. Well, let's complete your reply, um, if it's going to be five minutes, and then we'll, we'll adjourn. Um, my Lord, on, on, the, on the longer time, post-20 period, what Mr. Marici re repeatedly refers to is that they modelled it within the AOS. So they did do assessments post-2050 in the AOS, but again, that is no answer to the non-inclusion of it in the, sorry, in the AMPS. So, in one sense, it makes the problem. They modelled it to do their internal thinking, but then didn't build the post-2050 period into the test for the development control stage. That rather makes rather than answering the, the problem. So that's that's um, uh, the non-CO2 and the limitations points and the judges' reasoning. SEA, um, my lords, can I, can I ask you, um, uh, just to bring to hand volume eight of the Hillingdon bundles, and within that tab three, You have within that, I'm just going to take the one page, 1383. It should be a printed sideways schedule of contents. Yes. Um, if you look, looking at the page numbers out of the right hand page, page 45 to which it's referring is the Kyoto Protocol, and page 49 is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, sorry, page? Yeah, so, on, on 1383, looking back yeah. from the index, yes, back, I it, yes. 45 is Kyoto, Thank you, yes. and 49 is UN Framework Convention. Yes. But this is the scoping document, so they were scoped in, and yet they are long in the tooth and have been to some extent if not entirely domestically implemented but the one that was not included in the scope of the process was the one that is current and live well it's the date of the document March 16 pre pre enforced pre yes. 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 You, it, it had been open for signature it had been open for signature in December 2015 and, and it was foreseeable presumably that, that um, uh, with the fair winds that the UK and others were giving it would, it would hit its uh, numerical target. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the date of this document. March 2016. March Mr. 20. Mr. Richard's point is that's pre-Paris being... Oh yes, I mean, I understand the point. I just yeah. want to get the date. Mm. Um, your submission is that Paris should have been there. But, but yes, if those two were in, then they clearly were right in, then, then Paris clearly should be too. Um, in terms of what the Paris obligation is, can I just remind you of the, the wording of um, Annex I Annex I Annex I um, uh, 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 little Lim E. Annex 1, yeah. Annex 1, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's the environmental protection objectives established at international level which are relevant and any environmental considerations which have been taken into account during its pregnancy, during its preparation. So this is a reasons giving obligation. It's not just a habit in the list obligation, it's in your environmental report say how you've dealt with it. I, I just want to focus for a moment, but maybe the moment ought to be later, but. Um, I'll, I'll get the point out there. Um, 
SEA is a process, and it's a, it's a process that runs in parallel with the, um, the subject um, plan or project. Um, so it, it can be, often is, a lengthy process. in the course of which the authors of the environmental report, or indeed those who are involved in the uh, conduct of the process, can revisit questions. Is that right? Well, of course not. Um, how, how does that, uh, and, and one can clothe that observation with reference to the relevant provisions in the directive and the regulations, uh, how, how does that um, play into your submissions. I, is, I it part, is it part of your argument that this, even if even if it were legitimately not included at the initial stage, might have been brought in later and should have been brought in later? Is that your argument? Well, I, I suppose the point that comes to Mr. Marici's point about the March 2016 scoping exercise. Well, that's what prompted Even it. if it was lawfully excluded in 2016, can I just make another point about that? Of course, the Climate Change Committee gave its advice before Paris came into effect. Yes. They, they jumped the gun too. So, so this notion that you needed everybody signed up and therefore that the, the agreement came into force didn't stop the Climate Change Committee uh, opining on Paris. They saw it coming down the track. In terms of my Lord's point, um, uh, we accept, of course, that even if the AOS had somehow lawfully done that, sorry, the scoping report had some lawfully done that right in March 2016, it could nonetheless have been rolled into the deliberations heading up to June of 2018. And indeed, we say it precisely should have been in the light of the emerging thinking evolving through the spring of 2018 process. Because as we know, uh, the understanding ramped up in that period. So we accept that the 2016 scope report was not the last word on it. But that may matter when I come to look at the evidence, which I will in a brief moment. But the importance of this point in the SEA is not merely that it should have been in the environmental report, but that having it in there, which or not having it in there, which is a freestanding legal error of its own right, also identified a mechanism by which it would have gone into thinking and potentially informed the ANPS. Oh yes, the, the SEA process is not, uh, not, an an e not an end in itself. Exactly right. It's a, it's, it's a means, and an important means, to better decision making. Exactly. And, and, that, and that's where the concession on Paris and the thinking emerging in the early part of 2018 is so important, because if SEA had forced this onto the, the table, rather than 10 3 a no matter which route, who forces it onto the table within the DFT where these things are being discussed, it might have led to a different AMPS. That's why they're two different parallel pathways. Well, that then takes me um, briefly, if I may, to um, uh, the evidence which you've got. Uh, it's the evidence, uh, it, it's in the Climate Change uh, Annex bundle. Uh, at page uh, 3.128, you've seen it several times before. I just want to be very clear about what it does and doesn't say. Page 86. Page 86? No, it may, not, it may be wrong. Uh, it may be wrong. Uh, yes, it is. 80, 87, really. Yeah. Um, so the, the point that Mr. Marici makes is that uh, 86 is dealing, yes, with the scoping report, but then he says at the top of 87, what the witness says is the AOS has followed this advice. So this is said to be the explanation for not including it, but this is all we have. The AOS has followed this advice and considered existing legal obligations as the correct basis for assessing the carbon impact of the project. So we said that is no answer for SEA purposes, no answer, because Annex 1, little e, specifically calls for consideration of the international obligations and by necessary implication, even though they haven't been domestically incorporated. That's point one. And in any event, you then go to talk about the Climate Change Committee advice. The Climate Change Committee advice could not be an answer, because as you've seen, the Climate Change Committee in 2016 said don't change targets now, but it absolutely did not say that nothing would be needed to do about Paris. So actually, the Climate Change Committee's advice, if that was what was being relied on, um, wouldn't have provided the answer at the time, and certainly didn't provide the answer by 2018. And as I say, none of that can be an answer to excluding an unincorporated legal 
its obligation because that's the structure, that's the structure of, of the directive. Um, well, uh, moment, moments, if I may, on the mass energy test. Um, you, you have it in uh, tab 13 of the climate change bundle. It's at page 307. It's sidelined. I won't take you to it now. In the middle of that, you will see that the important consideration which leads the courts to set a higher threshold is if it takes the view that all the argument has been heard, that could be heard at a substantive hearing, and then this is the important thing, and there will be some substantial prejudice, in that case to a developer who was waiting to pull concrete, by merely prolonging the agony of then going through it all again at a substantive hearing down the track. Yeah. Because that would be contrary to public policy. So it's absolutely embedded in, in the prejudice or the impact of the notional delay between the grant of permission and the rerunning of the process of the substantive hearing. That's why it doesn't arise on, on a rolled-up hearing like this, because there is no prejudice, if you like, in that. And the only reason I anticipate uh, this put forward by Mr. Murici's clients um, is to try and persuade the court not to grant permission when it would otherwise do so, with a view to trying to head off further appeal words be one. Now, obviously, we hope you will agree with us on the law so that the, so the, um, that doesn't arise, but that is not a good reason. That is not a good reason to set a high threshold. On Mr. Humphrey's points, I simply say they go to relief. They're bad because they try and go behind the Secretary of State's concession, which is no good, which can't be done. Um, and in terms then of more specific relief, well, I've saved my positions until we know what the court says, because obviously any relief flowing from success on these grounds was crucially dependent on what the court would decide. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, as unless I could just further those questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Crossland, it's ten past one. We're going to adjourn now, as I said we would. Um, we'll start again at five past two. Um, that will give you the opportunity to reflect on the submissions you want to make to us in reply, bearing in mind that we've had a, um, a very full reply from Mr. Wolfe just now. And if there are points that he has advanced that you can simply adopt, then that would be a quite suitable course to take. I hope that helps you. Five past two. Bye.